Hello and Namaste. My name is Brandon and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. If you're new to the channel, welcome and it's great to have you. If you're a returning viewer, it is great to have you back. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with classmates, colleagues, or friends, or anyone else you think might benefit from watching. Now that we are introduced, let's go ahead and get started. So in this video, we're gonna pick up where we left off from the last video. In the last video, we looked at forward selection, which is one of the four common regression model building techniques. So forward selection and backward elimination, which is what this video is about, are very similar. They're actually mirror opposites. So if you understand forward selection, you'll get backward elimination. Now, if this is completely new to you, I highly suggest going back and watching that video and then coming back to this one. This video will be a lot shorter because I'm not going to go over all that again. So let's go ahead and dive in. So there are three common techniques for building iterative regression models, forward selection, backward elimination, and stepwise regression. The fourth common technique is not iterative. It's called best subsets regression. So best subsets examines all possible combinations of feature variables. It's kind of a brute force method that can be computationally expensive. It's gonna try every combination of every number of variables that you have. There can be hundreds and hundreds of different models, even for relatively small variable feature sets. So the analyst can specify the maximum number of features, which can cut down on the output you receive, and the analyst can request the best two or three models for each number of feature variables. Now it's important to note that forward selection in the previous video, backward elimination in this video, and of course the next two we'll cover later, these will not always produce the same best model. Sort of the way each one of them works, it is quite possible that they will produce different models. And as analysts, that's something we have to keep in mind when we build these models. So forward versus backward. The process and logic of forward selection and backward elimination are mirror opposites of each other. If you understand forward selection, understanding backward elimination will be very easy. Backward elimination does have the trait of showing the individual contribution to reduction in SSE, which are sum of squares due to error, by each feature variable at the start. And like I said before, it is important to point out that forward, backward, stepwise, and best subsets may not generate the same, quote, best model. And we'll talk about that more as we look at all four together. So backward elimination. Just like forward selection, feature variables are examined one at a time. The analyst sets a stopping rule. There are several, such as p-value, that we'll use because it's easy to understand, that acts as a hurdle the variable must overcome, in this case, to avoid being rejected from the model. Not included, it's included by default, but to avoid being rejected from the model. Now the variable we are examining must not reduce error significantly. That's a weird way of thinking about it because we're used to thinking about it the other way, which is forward selection. So the variable we're looking at must not reduce error significantly. That's another way of saying that whether the variable is in the model or not, has very little effect on the model's sum of square due to error. The feature variable that reduces model error, or SSE, the least is chosen so long as it passes the stopping rule. Once a variable is out of the model, it stays out. It is never allowed back in. Then the process repeats until all variables are out of the model or no variable clears the stopping rule. Just like forward selection, backward elimination does have some flaws to it. So the ability of variables to reduce error can change as other variables exit the model. As feature variables are removed, others can overlap and interact in how they explain variance, or on the flip side, how they reduce error or don't reduce error. Since a feature variable is permanently removed from the model once it exits, backward elimination is not flexible. It is possible for a variable that exited early to overcome the stopping rule later as other variables are removed but it's out of the model permanently. There's also a temptation factor for your R squared. So as variables are removed, the R squared will always decrease or stay the same. And you, the model builder, are sitting there watching your R squared or your explained variance go down as variables are kicked out. So there's always that temptation factor to wanna keep variables in. 
So here's a quick example. This is a very generic off the cuff example. So we have variable one, variable two, variable three, and variable four. So V1, V2, V3, and V4. And they start in the model by default. That's all our variables, they start in the model. So let's say V4 is removed, then V3 is removed, and then V2. But now we look at our variables and it's possible that V4 could, if allowed, get back in the model. But since it is eliminated, it cannot return. So squared semi-partial correlations, which we talked about at length in the forward selection video, can tease out the relationships. It can also miss suppressor and or complementary relationships. I don't want to go into this in great detail, but suppressor variables are kind of weird variables where a first variable correlates with the dependent variable or the target variable to some degree. That's a, I think I used 0.4 in the previous video. That leaves 0.6 unexplained to the target variable. Well, a second variable comes in and it is not correlated with the target variable, but it is correlated with the 0.6 of the first variable. Hope that makes sense. So a suppressor variable can actually correlate with a part of another variable without correlating to the target variable. And then we have complementary variables that are negatively correlated with each other, but together explain the target variable very well, a sort of a trade-off situation. And again, I talked about that at length in the previous video, so I won't go over it again here. So step one, evaluate the full model. So we dump all of our variables in right at the start. And we're using the same house price data that I used in the previous video. It's data I scraped off the web for the area kind of around where I live. And I changed it up a little bit to use in these teaching modules. So we dump all four variables in right from the start. So we evaluate each variable. We find the small F values, which will be aligned with small sum of squares for that variable. So we find the small values, not the large ones, like we did in forward selection. Then we ask, is the p-value, the probability, greater than, in this case, 0.05? Before, in forward selection, we're looking at the probability of less than 0.05. Here's the opposite. We're looking for high probabilities. If yes, then we remove that variable and compare what we have left. We note our SSC, our degrees of freedom, and our p-value. Now to reiterate, this p-value threshold is completely up to us. It's up to the analyst. We can set it very low or very high, depending on how strict or liberal we want to be in rejecting variables. And there are other criteria besides p-value that can be used. But to keep it simple for these modules, we're just going to go ahead and keep it at p-value. All right. So here is the output from Jump, JMP, which is created by SAS. As I said before, I love using it for teaching these regression models because you can actually click on things and have it do each thing one at a time. So a couple things to point out. You notice that all feature variables are entered. So I went ahead and pressed that enter all button up there in the upper right. And you can see down below, we have entered checked next to all four of our variables. Then we set a probability to leave. So in this case, I actually set it to 0.1. That's different than 0.5, but the principle is the same. It's 0.1, so it's a little bit higher. And then for direction, we're going backward. So we make sure we set that. Now we look at our SSC and our R squared. Now at this stage, with all the variables entered, our SSE will be at its minimum. That's as low as that SSC is going to go. As we remove variables, our error will probably increase. It will creep up. Now at this stage, our R square is also at its maximum. So 0.7358, that is the maximum explained variance we are gonna get out of this set of data and these variables. So it can only stay the same or go down from here. Down below, we have the unique ability of each feature variable to reduce SSE. So if we look in the SS column down below, that is the sum of squares allocated uniquely to that individual variable. It's not accounting for any shared variance. It's accounting for that unique contribution of that variable. So we can see that based off this list here, by looking at it, it appears that square footage is 117971. That is by far the highest unique sum of squares. Then we look at the other ones and what do we see? We can see that number of bedrooms at the very bottom there 
has by far the lowest sum of squares allocated to it, and its F ratio is by far the smallest. So the squared semi-partial correlations is a way of measuring the contribution of each individual variable to the model. It's very easy to calculate. So it's just the F ratio we see here in our F ratio column, divided by the degrees of freedom residual, or degrees of freedom due to error, it's DFE in this output, which in this case would be 95 on this screen, multiplied by one minus the R squared, and that's it. So we could find the contribution of each variable, the amount of explained variance, by using this little formula over here on the right. And in the previous video, I went into that in great depth. So we look at our variables, we find the one with the smallest sum of squares contribution, the lowest F ratio, and look at its probability. Well, we can see that the probability for beds is 0.28629. That's well above our threshold we set of 0.1 in this case. So we remove beds, it has the smallest sum of squares, and it fails our stopping rule. Now what's the next one? So we removed beds, you can see that the entered checkbox is empty. The next one is exemplary high school. So it has a sum of squares of 18283, that's the next smallest, F ratio of 11.875, so that stays in the model. And now we stop, that's as far as we can go. All the variables that are in there meet our stopping rule, and therefore that's our final model. Let's quickly take a look at how things changed by removing number of bedrooms from the model. So we can see here that our SSE is 147815. If you look at the top, the SSE is 146046, or 47 approximately. They're almost the same. So yes, our SSE crept back up, but it went from 6047 to 7814 it went up by around 1800. That's all it did, right? So if you look down here for the sum of squares for beds, what is it? No, well, it's that same amount. Now we should also point out, and it's important to note, that a root mean square error, which is sort of a measure of how well the data fits in the model, went from 39 to one, approximately at the top, to 39.24. It hardly changed at all. Did it go up a little bit? Absolutely. Did it go up by a lot? Absolutely not. Now look at the R square. So with all the variables, our R square was 0 0.7358. We took out number of bedrooms, and yes, it went down, but it went to 0 0.7326. It hardly budged at all. And that's because number of bedrooms made very little, if any, contribution to the overall model. So even though we took out that variable, we didn't really lose anything. And there is evidence over here on the right in some of these other measures that this is in fact a better model. So Mallow's C, the AICC, and stuff like that, but we'll get to that in later videos. So we took out number of bedrooms, but didn't really lose anything by doing it. All right, so remember how this model did for my own house? Here's our regression equation with our three variables in it. Each square foot is worth $73.20. We have to multiply everything by a thousand to get the actual dollar value. So each square foot is worth 73.20. Being in an exemplary school district adds $28,930 to the value of the home. That's because exemplary high school is an indicator variable. It's either one or zero. So if it's a one, it adds 28,930 to the value of the home. And then each bathroom adds $35,470 to the value of the home. That's just a regular number. So if I plug in the numbers for my house, it comes out to a price or a value of $174,915. And as I mentioned, I bought my house for $172,300. That was a few years ago. So for my house, this is a very, very good model. All right, so that wraps up this video on backward elimination. Again, very similar to forward selection. It's just sort of the mirror opposite. So in forward selection, we add one variable at a time, assuming it meets our stopping rule. In backward elimination, we remove one variable at a time if it fails to get over the hurdle of our stopping rule. And then we can see how the numbers change as variables are removed. And we notice that a lot of them didn't change very much by removing that one variable, which is good. We wanna have the simplest model possible that explains 
the most amount of variance. That's always what we're looking for when we're building multiple regression models like this. So thank you very much for watching. I appreciate you spending some of your valuable time learning with me, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.